Oh, you can hear. Fabulous. So the other room is hearing. Is our online team hearing? Great. And Okay. And with that, if our reviser is ready for an overview on 2243, uh, I believe I look to you, Mr. Weiss. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, 2243. This was the bill that um, would ex um, extend the, the time period for the CAPERS actuarial experience study. Um, it's currently once every three years. This would extend it out in statutes every four years but also give the, uh, the Board of Trustees of Japers um, some flexibility to adjust that to back to three years or is up to as many as five years in their discretion as, as fiduciaries to the, uh, can, the Capers Trust Fund. So it'd be four years is sort of the baseline in statute with um, some leeway with the Capers Board and their fiduciary duty. Thank you. Committee, any questions? Representative Neighbor. I don't have any questions. And uh, if there are no uh, amendments to the bill or balloons at this time, I would make a motion uh, based on the wonderful uh, testimony of Alan Conroy and what this does. Um, I uh, would move, Mr. Chairman, that we pass House Bill 2243 out favorably. Thank you. Motion by Representative Neighbor, seconded by Representative Riley. Um, discussion? If there is no discussion, any discussion from our, our uh, higher chamber room <laughs> next door? And seeing none, Representative, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I will close. Thank you. Re you've heard the motion by Representative Neighbor to pass 2243 favorable. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. Ayes appear to have it. Ayes do have it. And 2243 is passed. Thank you, uh, Representative and Committee. That will take us to House Bill 2136. I felt this one we heard a little while ago. I asked if Lee Modisett with the department would give us just an update to the pieces that were in there to bring us back uh, on track. And then we will go to a, uh, a quick overview from the reviser. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lee Modisett, Kansas Insurance Department. Uh, 2136 is what we've referred to as our cleanup bill, as a quick summary, uh, just to remind everybody the contents that are in there. There's been uh, some discussion since the hearing on a couple of these items. Section one dealt with administrative uh, subpoena power. Uh, if, you, if you remember, may recall from the testimony, uh, what we were trying to do there is, is streamline that process. Since that hearing, we've had uh, some conversations with uh, groups who are supportive of the goal of, of trying to reduce fraud, but had some questions and concerns about the language. And just in the interest of time, uh, we felt like it would be a better uh, use of your all's time if we tried to work on that. Um, and so we would request when you uh, go to work the bill um, to remove all of section one uh, to, to give us that opportunity to uh, work with those folks who had expressed concern. Section 2 and Section 10 deal with the auto club registration. Uh, again, this is something that has existed uh, well before the internet. Um, we don't believe that it's a necessary process anymore. Uh, so Sections 2 and 10 got rid of the auto club registration completely. Similar to Section 1, though, uh, we did have some auto clubs who reached out to us and said, hey, we appreciate that you're trying to reduce regulation. Uh, we're for that, but we have seen in other states that if you don't define what is an auto club, um, that other uh, regulators after you may actually try to regulate as this insurance. Um, so we would ask that uh, when it comes time to work the bill that we define what is an auto club solely for the purpose of making it perfectly clear that we're not trying to uh, regulate any further. Uh, Section 3 dealt with um, the rate related to uh, excess lines. Current process requires us to do that via rules and reg, but statute actually defines what that rate is essentially, so we're proposing to move that to just publication in the register. Uh, 
Section 4 dealt with the um, non-forfeiture rate of annuities. So this would set the floor um, in an annuity contract, again, wouldn't, wouldn't require that an annuity contract offer 15 basis points, uh, but that would be the, the floor that's a change from, from 1%. Uh, also wanted to just reiterate that that's only uh, if somebody is on new, on new annuities and is only if somebody is uh, canceling or, or uh, the annuity is being canceled due to non-payment. And then sections five, six, and seven deal with um, utilization review. This is the committee um, that's in statute that hasn't met since 2015. Um, and that's already, that process is already being handled by uh, another entity called URAC. And then sections eight and nine deal with um, PEOs and moving the uh, filing for their audited finance or moving the filing for their financials from 60 to 120 days to better align with uh, the process of when those uh, financials are actually available. And if, if need be, I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you for that overview and an update on some of the work that was done. While I know there wasn't total agreement to that, I think it eliminated uh, concerns that had existed. So I appreciate the department's work there. Um, committee, are there questions that you would wish to direct to the department? Representative Neighbor? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So are we going to hold back on this because of all the chopping that's going on and the changes that have been made? Um, you, certainly, you, that would be uh, one option. Our, our preference in bringing the uh, changes forward is the rest of the policy we feel like is pretty benign and non-controversial and just good cleanup stuff. Um, so by making those changes, it would allow us to work on, um, allow us to work on the one piece that seemed to give folks heartburn. All right, so it would go back and, and get a little bit more work before we are looking at it because that's a lot, that's a big concept, Bill. <laughs> Well, yeah, so sec section one um, was the, the thing that gave uh, some folks heartburn, and so we're just proposing to completely take that out. Um, we didn't really feel like, given the time constraints, that we could get all the parties together to actually um, get good language in a, t in a timely fashion. So rather than rush the product, um, uh, we, we asked those folks to work with us kind of between sessions to come back to the with with a different bill to try to address address those concerns um, and then just adding a definition related to the auto club it's actually the definitions already in um, statute so it's it's just has to be put back in in a different spot since we're getting rid of the rest of the of the statute so what is the hope for this bill that we just we pass out just the benign part or yes or yeah. that it goes back and you yeah. work on the rest our our request would be that the bill get kicked out with the rats and cats for lack of a better term um none, none of the rest of it was um in any way shape or form controversial um this for what it's worth the senate the senate side did um make the amendments in committee and kicked it out uh, without section one and adding the definition so that's been taken care of on the Senate side? Yep. With that, Mr. Chairman, I would move that we pass out House Bill 2136 as Mr. amended. Yes. Uh, Just for the discussion. Yes, Supervisor. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. I, I do have a balloon for you for your consideration. Um, I know you have to... to move that we work the bill first, but I do have the balloon prepared for your consideration. Great. Thank you. And I, uh, I will continue with any questions for the department, but I don't know if there's anything further to overview from the revisor's standpoint, but I will look to you for the general overview and then we'll come back to you for the balloon as well. So okay. thank you. So um, I th for the purpose of discussion, I would like to move that we pass House Bill 2136 out favorably as amended. So um, I thank you, Representative, and I do appreciate that. However, if we can finish with questions for the department, I would normally not have I'm sorry. them thank come you. in during our debate, but uh, we're on the same page. So thank you. I believe we did have a question from Representative Miller. No, I actually was going to make a motion to, oh, I, think, I think, I <laughs> think, 
amend the bill consistent with what I believe the balloon's going to be. But well, great. I think the committee is ahead of me on that anyway. I'll circle back and ask if anyone else has questions of the department. And a good question was raised, and my understanding is that we wanted to pass uh, sections two through ten with the definition on section two just striking section one as we had heard it. Um, and while there are some who may wish to still have section one in, and that's a debate we can have, uh, the department had helped us with a balloon through that. So uh, seeing no other questions at the moment, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, for just a moment, uh, Eileen, I don't know if there's any other overview that we would want from our revisor on the bill, but I would, I'd like you to just double check us before we jump forward. Um, not at, at the risk of inflating Lee's ego too much, I would say that he did a great job explaining what's contained in the bill, and I'm happy to go over the balloon when okay. necessary. So thank you. So what that actually tells me is if I would have just been quiet and originally accepted the motion, we'd be in exactly the same place as we are now. <laughs> so Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would move that we pass House Bill 2136 out favorably as amended. So, so thank you. I'll take the uh, motion, if we may, and then we'll bring the balloon uh, for the amendment, if that's okay. I just, okay. I, pa I, so, I move that we pass out House Bill 2136 out favorably. Thank you for that. Seconded by Representative Riley. Um, discussion? Representative Miller. I would move adoption of the balloon amendment, assuming the balloon amendment is as per described by the insurance commissioner's office, which is basically to remove section one. Thank you for the motion to amend. Is there a second to that? Second. Seconded by Representative Neighbor. And if the reviser would distribute and explain the balloon. Mm -hmm. So I believe that um, Jan emailed out the balloon right before committee started. But um, in case you don't have your computers with you, I, I'm sharing the screen right now so you can see the balloon itself. Um, so the balloon does strike the language in section one that is exactly as described. In section two, I, I cleaned up this uh, for the purpose of language because we don't really use it like that. Um, with regard to the definition of an automobile club service contract, what I'm doing here is we're stating um, the stricken language says that a service contract does not include an automobile club service as defined in KSA 40-2507. Now, what's interesting is that KSA 40-2507 was enacted in 1967, which makes it exactly as old as I am, and it does not define service contract. So um, we had to kind of, the, the Senate's version of this bill actually goes into a definition of service contract, a definition of auto club, and then a listing of what an auto club service contract contains. Now, what we did with this version, and I do stress that the, this bill amendment looks different and it is different. What the department did is give you a choice when, if and when this bill makes it to conference. Um, we stated that the service contract is not include an automobile service contract and then we stated we actually or the department actually came up with a definition because one did not exist in statute so they come up with it they they kind of made one up and it says that an automobile club service contract means a contract that provides in consideration of dues assessments or periodic payments of money it promises to assist in matters related to travel and the operation, use, and maintenance of an automobile 
in the supply of features or services or reimbursement thereof, which may include, and then uh, such services as community tra traffic safety services, travel and touring service, theft or reward service, map service, towing service, emergency road service, bail bond service, and legal fee reimbursement service in the defense of traffic offenses. None of which enumerated features or services are provided by the promisor itself, um, meaning the company shall be subject to the insurance laws of the state. So it's very clearly specifically calling those items out as not being insurance. Um, so, uh, subparagraph B states that the pur purchase of accidental injury and death benefits insurance coverage issued as provided by applicable statute by an insurance company authorized to do business that may come under the definition again of the service contract or such other features or services not deemed to by the commissioner to constitute the business of insurance. So all those items would um, fall under that definition of auto club service contract and again not be considered insurance. And I can stand for questions. Any questions? Representative Dodson. Um, I'm not sure of the process. Um, when you start reading the act at the top, it, it gives certain powers to the commissioner. So now I'm confused if we remove number one Section one, is the intent to put it back in at some point, or do we think the bill stands alone without section one? So, uh, is, the reviser, so yes. Okay, so I think what you're referring to is the long title at the top, and um, Yes, at the very top where it says relating to the regulation of business thereof, granting the commissioner the power to subpoena witnesses and order depositions when conducting certain investigations. I do need to strike that out of the long title. You're absolutely correct because the bill would not reflect that as part of what the bill does any longer. The rest of it would stay the same. Thank you very much. So thank you, Representative. And just to reiterate then, Eileen, as we look to that, as I get a little closer in lines two and three, we would strike substantially all. Yes, everything in line two after thereof and everything in line three up to updating. And we will consider that as a part of this balloon. Thank you. Acceptable to the maker of the motion. Thank you, Representative Dodson. Further questions? Um, I would have one question. In the notes that we had on the second part, the section B, we were defining what was not insurance. Is that correct? As we we're looking through all of that on the second part. And I wondered in section B, the purchase of uh, uh, AD and D benefits, accidental injury and death benefits um, issued by an uh, applicable statutes, why would that not be considered insurance? I am, I, think, am um, I just thinking wrong? I think those are those ancillary policies that come just because you're a special member of a special group, but I, um, I believe we can speak to that a little bit more specifically. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Oh, yes, Lee. Yeah, so the intent here is to make sure that the club is not insurance. So they may offer products that are as a, as a benefit, and those would, be, those would still be insurance subject to if they happen to offer those, but the club itself is not an insurer offering the insurance product. Other questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you for the description. Is there any other discussion on the amendment? Seeing no further discussion on the amendment, Representative Miller, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move the amendment. 
heard the motion by Representative Miller to uh, um, amend as described in the balloon. All those in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes appear to have it. Ayes do have it. The motion passes. Uh, back on the bill as amended. Representative Neighbor. I say the third time's a charm. <laughs> of course, this could be the fourth. I just, it's hard to tell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move at this time that we pass out House Bill number 2136 favorably for passage as amended. Thank you, Representative. Is there a second? Representative Riley. Um, discussion. Seeing no discussion, you, you may close. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I close. Thank you, Representative. You've heard the motion by Representative Neighbor to pass 2136 favorably as amended. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Opposed, no. Eyes appear to have it. Eyes do have it, and the motion passes. Thank you for your work on, on those bills, committee, and thank you for the work by everyone around us uh, in, in bringing that to our attention. Um, with that, I think we'll move to our hearing on House Bill 2242 in that our conferees are here and then continue with the rest of our agenda. So to open the hearing on 2242, I'd ask for a review by the revisor's office. Thank you, Mr. Chair. House Bill 2242 increases the percentage amount that the state fire marshal may levy on fire insurance company premiums caused by fire business being transacted in Kansas. So under current law, each fire insurance company that does business in Kansas is required to pay a levy on or before March 15th of each year of 0.8% of the fire insurance company's gross cash receipts of the previous year. This levy is paid in addition to the taxes, fees, and charges that the fire insurance company is statutorily required to pay. House Bill 2242 would increase that percentage amount from 0.8% to 1.0% for the calendar year 2021 and for each calendar year thereafter, the bill would become effective upon its publication in the statute book and I can stand for questions. Thank you. Any questions, committee? Seeing none, thank you for the overview. I, I would look briefly to research to go over the fiscal note. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, committee members. Um, as a Eileen explained, this is an increase on, with, of the levy on gross cash receipts of fire insurance premiums that are remitted to the state fire marshal each year, and that would increase from the 0.8% to 1.0% beginning in calendar year 2021. The Office of the State Fire Marshal in estimates that enactment of this bill would increase its revenues by approximately $1.0 million to the fire marshal fee fund each year beginning in fiscal year 2022. The office um, indicates that this would address some financial shortfalls, and I'm sure they will address those within their own testimony. Um, the enactment of the bill would not create any additional expenditures for the office. The insurance department was also consulted for the fiscal note and indicates enactment of the bill would increase the total fire tax percentage on fire insurance premiums from 1.25 to 1.45% by increasing this levy from the 0.8 to 1.0%. The department indicates that the fiscal effect to update the tax percentage on premium tax filings would be minimal on the department and could be absorbed within its own existing resources. Thank you. Any questions on the fiscal note? Seeing none, thank you. That will bring us to our first proponent testimony. We welcome Doug Jorgensen, our state fire marshal, to the committee. Mr. Chair Committee, <clears throat> for allowing me to appear here today with supportive and informational testimony on 2242. As already stated, um, currently 1.25% of the insurance premium levy is distributed amongst our office, the Board of EMS, and KU Fire and Rescue Training. 
we receive 0.8% of the 1.25. The uh, Emergency Medical Services Board receives 0.2%, and KU, or excuse me, 0.25%, and then K, Kansas Fire and Rescue Training Institute receives 0.2%. Um, the amount our agency is receiving is currently not sufficient to fund the statutory and legislative responsibilities currently mandated to the agency. Um, I do have some attachments, one of those being the actual statute, 751508, that breaks out the percentage uh, breakdown. And then I also have two pages on the history of 751508 for the committee. There's been no increase in the percentage from the insurance premium levy since 1983. Um, back in 2002, it was actually reduced to 1%. And then in 2004, it went back to 1.25. But in 2004, the Emergency Medical Services Board and the Kansas Fire and Rescue Training were also added. So it actually reduced the portion of the levy our office was receiving from 1.25% down to the 8% or excuse me, 0.8% that it currently is. Uh, the second issue affecting our lack of sufficient funding is the sweeps our agency um, happened uh, between 2015 and 2019. And we actually um, received just a little bit over $9 million in sweeps on the fire marshal fee fund over that five years. And there is a uh, breakdown in my last attachment with the amounts that were swept each year. Um, we basically operate on two six month fiscal years because the transfers from the insurance premium levy come to our agency in June and December. So <clears throat> with that large transfer in June, it always looks like we have a high balance at the end of the fiscal year, but that June transfer we get are the dollars that we need to operate on for the first six months of the new fiscal year. So a lot of times when I've been before other committees and they see that high balance, I always have to explain that that those are actually funds that we'll use for the first six months of the new fiscal year. Um, over time, uh, of course, we've had increases in cost of living increases, either from the legislature or the governor. The indices that are charged by other state agencies continue to increase and also inflation. Um, in 2016, we were approved to hire four additional, uh, excuse me, we were given the responsibility for the search and rescue program for the state. And then in FY 2020, the legislature gave us the permission to hire four additional inspectors to cover the workload that we have increasing at our agency. Um, in order to balance this fiscal year, we had to discontinue the Kansas Firefighter Recruitment and Safety Grant in our Get Along Kansas Smoke Alarm program. The increase in funding would let us bring those two programs back and be able to fund those going forward. Um, in closing, I just asked the committee to seriously consider this increase in funding for our office so that we can fulfill our statutory legislative mandates and continue to provide for the safety of our state firefighters and our citizens. With that, I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Committee questions? I have a, a representative Dodson. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. I don't know much about how you're funded, but is this uh, does this represent all of the funding source that you have? In other words, is this a 20% increase, or do you have other funding sources for your department? This, this the insurance premium levy fund funds probably 95 or 96% of our budget. We also, we inherited the boiler inspection program from labor about five or six years ago. There's some funding there just for the boiler program. And then we receive a little bit of 
save cigarette money for the work we do in testing cigarettes around the state to make sure they meet the statutory requirements. But it's by far the majority of our funding. Thank you. Other questions? I was going to try and get a handle on, on some of those items as well. So the two that you just mentioned, are those programs pretty well fully funded by the monies that came with them, or are they also a drain on your fund? No, the two programs I mentioned are funded by the money we receive in those two programs. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that the fee fund had had a lot of sweeps and uh, challenges there. Curious about a couple of things. Do we still rely on that fee fund? Uh, what is the balance that is there? And how had we built those balances to that level over time? Most of those balances were actually built over time um, before my tenure. And then, um, you know, the, the sweeps have taken place while I've been there, but over time, um, the insurance premium levy was bringing in sufficient funds to operate the agency and there was a surplus. So when the sweeps did come about, um, really, you know, that money was extra. But because of those sweeps and with no increase in the insurance premium levy since the 80s, just because of increase of inspection, or excuse me, expenses, um, salary increases, all those different things like that. The current amount that we're getting from the insurance premium fund, we're about zeroed out right now. And in fact, to make sure that we didn't overspend or go in the red, we had to cancel those two programs for this fiscal year. Thank you, so the fee fund is currently flat, essentially. Basically it is. Um, the one handout that is colored um, looks like this. Gives the committee a breakdown since 2004, um, the amount of money that's going to the State General Fund, Board of EMS, AU Fire and Rescue, and our office. Um, you can see since 2005, uh, when the split was changed, uh, it took us till 2012 to get back to the same level of funding we were at in 2004. And then you can see the increases each year. The insurance premium levies do go up a little bit each year. Sometimes they go down, but most of the time they go up. Um, so there is a gradual increase in the amount of money we do receive from the levy, but it's not enough to keep up with our current expenses. You. It sounds like uh, some of the increases included the um, search and rescue program and then the additional inspectors. So there are four additional inspectors. What other uh, people or assets did we need to do this state uh, search and rescue program? We actually brought on one new employee to oversee and coordinate the state search and rescue program because um, we set it up the same as our HAZMAT program where we don't have all those people involved in either program as state employees. We do MOUs with local fire departments, and then we use those local firefighters of members for our HAZMAT and the search and rescue teams, but then we provide the necessary training and some of the high-end, high-tech equipment that they need to do those things. Thank you. And then were there four positions filled on the inspectors uh, for the 2020? Yes, there we... were. What happened there is, is we have MOUs with about 90 fire departments in the state. They like to be in their own buildings. So we have MOUs that allow them to go in and do the inspections in their own municipalities. And then they just share those reports with us. But over the last three or four years, because of budget cutbacks at the local level, they're returning those inspections to our office. And so at one point in time, we were getting like 600 or 700 inspections back a year. So we brought that to the legislature and they agreed to let us hire those four positions to cover that influx of inspections. Thank you. So 
Um, one of the pieces is an increase of five people, equipment, et cetera, uh, that is in addition to the budget that we had previously, and the rest would just be due to inflation. Is that what we'd be looking at in the increases? Yeah, and it's not necessarily an increase um, for search and rescue for those four positions, because at the time we had the funds to do that. But it's just, again, over time where the insurance premium levies have not kept up with inflation, the increase in cost indices, and the um, salary increases that the legislature or governor have put forward. And it's just sort of, it's taken a few years, but we're just sort of at a break-even point right now. Representative Neighbor. Do you all also handle... Uh, state instruction for the CIT program, or is that through the local entities themselves? CIT program. I'm okay, that's where you have a counselor uh, or a social worker going along with the uh, police or fire in case it's a person with a mental disability or an issue of that, because I know that we have a lot of that and that training had to be slowed down because of COVID. And I think expenses. So it may just be at a, at a county level right now. And it could be. And we do have fire investigators. We do have the search and rescue and hazmat responders. But they're not first responders like law enforcement or your local fire department. We're always there after the fact to help with whatever the issue is or to help with cleanup or whatever the case might be. So we are not involved in that program. And so what uh, we've got some areas I know that have their own fire marshals within the fire departments, but I'm sure there are a lot that can't afford to have maybe that position available. Is that when you go in and cover from the state perspective? We do. Um, currently in the state, probably about 85 or 86 percent of the fire departments in the state are volunteer. So there's only about 14% that are either full-time or full, a mixture of full-time, part-time. So we do keep very busy supporting the volunteer departments in the state because that's the majority of the departments. And they don't have the expertise for either hazmat, search and rescue, or for fire investigation. Thank you very much. Representative Riley. Uh, thank you for presentation. A couple of real quick questions. First of all, just to clarify on the sweeps, the last couple of years, is the state still sweeping funds out of your account? I, uh, I know that I just started on a budget account, and it seemed like whenever I saw budget numbers that was presented to us, it didn't include the sweep. But are you still having your funds swept So two years ago. Because there's, there's no balance. Okay. So then the, I guess my second kind of indirect question to that is, so are your employees, and would you review with me how many employees you have full-time? Um, approximately 70. So of your 70, do they fall under the state CAPERS plan or do they fall under uh, fire and police? Because there is a definite difference of, of what the different firefighters that are on the city plans that they are typically uh, part of maybe a little bit better plan than what your plan is kind of thing. So just, okay, thank you. Other questions, committee? So, and if I'm looking, the color chart that you had mentioned kind of lays out the budget for us, is that, uh, or at least the revenues for us, I should say. Um, as I look at, do I want to pay attention to that bottom available for the, the office? Uh, is that kind of the trend line that would show what's available to pay these, these fees and where we are needing the variance? Those other pieces had some pretty healthy increases, although it actually looks like there's been decent increases in the total levy, um, and part of it may have been eaten up by some of those other items. But 
Is that really where I need to look at that? And it looks like that's been increasing in the four to five percent range in recent years, but um, our costs are are a little higher than that. Yeah, it's it's not keeping up because currently um, our budget for 22 has been through both budget committees and I think approved by both full budget committees, and our budget for FY22 is about 6.3 million. Now you can't add in the money we have from the boiler program and the other fee I talked about, and that takes that 5.9 uh, from the insurance premium levy and adds you know some additional dollars to that. But the total actually still is right at or just below our approved budget for FY20. So thank you. And the increase in 22 would be below inflation from the previous year. That one is, is a pretty slim increase, and I see that. Um, however, and it's, it's not a huge number overall, but it would seem like an increase of a million in that number would be a little ahead of inflation. So, Well, the, the reason we asked for the 0.2% is, and I realize it's a million dollars, and I realize it's a lot, but it would allow us the, um, we had set aside $400,000 for the firefighter recruitment program for the volunteer departments in the state. They have a hard time recruiting and retention of firefighters. And a lot of the, like the bunker gear, the pants and jackets that they have, the helmets and gloves are very old and worn out. So with that grant program, we were allowing those departments to buy new bunker gear for the safety of their volunteer firefighters and to try and help keep the firefighters they have and be able to recruit new firefighters. So we use that money for that. There's an uptick in cancer in the fire service. So part of that grant money, we also purchased industrial type washing machines so that they could wash that bunker gear on a regular basis. Because if they don't, whenever they put it on, <coughs> excuse me, they're breathing in carcinogens and things from the past fires that they've been on. So we, and those washing machines run about $3,000 a piece. So we just had that program in place for the safety and the benefit of just the volunteer. It wasn't available to the full-time departments because we have some volunteer departments in the state where their annual budgets maybe only ten or $12,000 a year and a full set of bunker gear with gloves and boots runs between three and $4,000. So we were just trying to use those funds to help them out, <coughs> excuse me. And then our Get Alarm program for Kansas was basically um, we purchase and then give smoke alarms out through the local fire departments to the residents of the community. And we had been spending around $50,000 on that so all total, we reduced our spending this fiscal year by $450,000 and had to cancel those programs. So half of that increase would be just to bring those two programs back. So, so thank you, and I appreciate all that our firefighters do across the state from our large municipalities to the small ones. Um, I, I may follow up with one more, and then I will recognize Representative Neighbor. With, with the, um, the bunker gear and the washing machines, um, what things would I pay for with the local fire department in the local fire levy? Um, would that ever cover those types of items, or is that outside of that budget, or is that variable? It could be things that come out of the local budget, but again, on the volunteer side, especially with COVID, they're struggling budget-wise because depending on the department and where they're at, it's different all over the state with levies for their local fire response. And again, there's a number of departments. When we started the grant program, that only had an annual budget of maybe ten or twelve thousand dollars, and there's no way they can afford to purchase more than one set of bunker gear a year or the extractor machines. Uh, we also provide physicals for the volunteers because of the uptick in cancer. You know, no volunteer departments have money for 
to get their volunteers in for physicals. So part of that grant was if a volunteer wanted to get in and get a full physical, uh, just to make sure they were healthy and can continue in what they were doing, they would submit a bill to us and then we'd reimburse them. Thank you. Representative Neighbor. I actually used to serve on our fire department. And uh, one of the things that we've been lucky enough to do, and we are a fully staffed uh, fire department, but I know in, in other areas where small communities, training and all of that is essential, uh, we've even had some of our firefighters learn how to repair the, the fire gear. And the thing is, it has to meet uh, strict guidelines and the sewing machines they use, but uh, one of them had a parent who was a seamstress and taught him how to do that. So that has saved quite a bit in repairs on on that equipment because you ha you can't send anything out that's torn or ripped or isn't safe with the proper material and grade of of material. So it's it's a really interesting process. It is, and we've had firefighters injured because they go to a fire and they didn't have enough gear. And so we have one firefighter wearing the coat and the other firefighter wearing the pants. And so just another reason why we put forward that grant program. Thank you. Further questions? There are no further questions. Thank you for your work and for coming. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else wishing to appear as a proponent on House Bill 2242? Seeing none, we will move to our opponent testimony and welcome William Sneed, State Farm Insurance Companies, to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, I am Bill Sneed, uh, appearing today on behalf of State Farm Insurance Companies. Uh, I want to start off with, as I did in my testimony, written testimony, um, make it crystal clear that State Farm supports the hard work of the State Fire Marshal and the men and women at the front line who uh, work hard to protect uh, our insured's homes and valuable. However, having said that, uh, we, we cannot support House Bill 2242. And as I say in my testimony, uh, it's, uh, the, the bottom line is uh, this is a tax increase, and it's a tax increase on our policyholders. Now, we don't believe it is fair to our policyholders to attempt to correct Need to get closer? All right, thank you. Um, we don't think it's fair to our policyholders to ask them to incur additional tax burden for, for a better term, mistakes that previous legislator, legislatures and or fire marshals made starting in the early 2000s. Uh, as my testimony reflects, these changes from the 1.25 going to the state fire marshal to where it is today were all agreed to by the state fire marshal. We're all part of what the legislature wanted to have happen. And uh, I, I have a great, a huge amount of respect for our current fire marshal, so I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not shifting anything towards him, but uh, at, uh, I mean, the original deduction that the fire marshal got was only supposed to last for two years to kind of get the EMS program going. Well, the next year they said, well, we need another year. And after that, they said, well, we're gonna make it permanent. And oh, by the way, now we're gonna add KU. Those were decisions made by your predecessors and were supported by the state fire marshal. Uh, so we don't believe it is in, in fairness to our policyholders. Now, I don't wanna put mince words with anybody but the truth of the matter is, they've been receiving increases every year. Premiums are doing this. They're going up every year. 
And so when you add a percentage to that, that means you're gathering more money. Now, maybe it may not be enough money, uh, and, but that's a matter to bring to House Appropriations or Senate Ways and Means. And finally, uh, I, I, without taking a position, my client would not take a position, obviously, on the viability of sweeps that were done, but clearly that severely damaged the budgetary problem for the state fire marshal. But again, that was a decision made by the legislature and signed into law by the governor. So uh, based upon that, we urge the committee not to take action on House Bill 2242 and happy to answer questions at the appropriate time. Thank you for your testimony. Committee questions? Representative Miller. I may be completely lost, but when you talk about increasing premiums, what's that mean? What kind of increases? Uh, you'll see on the, uh, my second page of my testimony, uh, the direct fire premiums over the years and then the taxes collected. So they've uh, ranged in around every year an increase of two hundred to $300,000 a year. But my question is, I apologize because I wasn't clear, but what would this bill do? This bill would increase that number by 0.2%. Uh, I'm doing my math right. 0.2%. <laughs> yes, I believe so. Thank you. Uh -huh. Representative Dodson. Yeah, on the part of your testimony, uh, said would generate an estimated ten million six hundred eighty-three, or an increase of one point six million. So that's about fourteen fifteen percent. And when the uh, proponent testified, uh, we were going from point eight to one, which was a twenty percent increase. Is is this the increase that you've calculated? Uh, for fire insurance holders is one point, it would increase across the board for everyone who's paying $1.6 million more? It, uh, the, the amount would be, I believe, is the total amount. Uh, I have to go back into my um, research from the insurance department, but I believe that's the case. Thank you. Representative Neighbor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How many um, clients does State Farm have in Kansas? I beg your pardon? How many policies do you have in Kansas? Total number, I'm sorry, I don't know the total number. We, we insure about uh, 25 to 30 percent of all homes in the state of Kansas. Okay, could you give me the number on that? Um, and the reason I ask is a million dollars is a lot of money. Not a problem, but if you have a million customers and it meant a dollar per customer, I just want to see that ratio and what that would do. Um, I think that's also important in the conversation. Sure. Thank you. Uh -huh. Representative Riley. Just clarifying though, backing up uh, what Representative Neighbor said that you're only, this is only affecting property and casualty insurance. This is not affecting anything else. Is that That's correct? correct. That's correct. It's only affecting the fire portion of your, uh, of the policy that's written. Not the content, just the fire portion. And in the other room, we have a question from Representative Proctor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, I've got a, 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 my question is about uh, small businesses. You know, the, this has been a really, really tough uh, year and a half here for uh, Kansas small businesses. Um, this, uh, this levy would also affect uh, small business rates uh, for insurance. Is that, is that correct? That is correct. And um, do you have a sense proportionally how much of this burden would be borne by small businesses as compared to homeowners? 
I'm sorry I do not, but I can certainly ask the insurance department if they have it broken down by commercial versus homeowners. Thank you. Other questions, committee? Mr. Sneed, thank you. As I was looking at it and to the points that were raised earlier, this showed an increase of 1.698 or 1.7 million. Um, I don't know that you are in a position to, but I was curious if we could kind of true that 1.7 up with the 1 million fiscal note that we had from the uh, uh, division of budget on the fiscal note. Um, those two numbers we're just a little different. Um, again, the dollars aren't huge, but that's a pretty big variance in uh, magnitude. I, 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 I thought I was working off the same basic numbers from the insurance department that the people who prepared the fiscal note. I, I don't know where the difference is. I'm sorry. So, so thank you. It's helpful to have that uh, perspective, and we just want to try and get to the bottom of where those are going to make sure that uh, sure. if there is an increase intended that we have a better handle on what it might raise. So, so thank you on thank you. that. Um, I'm not seeing other questions at the moment. I might, uh, if our fire marshal had some clarification on that point that you wished to offer and only, only to that point. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair Committee. Um, that million dollar increase was figured on the current amount that we get and ad adding 0.2% to the current amount. Because right now uh, on my color sheet, I think for FY22, and that's an estimate by the insurance commissioner's office, I think it's 5.9 or 5.6 million. But that million dollar increase was simply figured a two tenths of percent increase on what we currently receive. So thank you. I appreciate that clarification. And uh, we, may, we may go offline with a couple of, of numbers just to make sure that we're all on the same page, but that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. With, with that, um, we do have a couple of other written opponents. Is there anyone else wishing to appear as an opponent on 2242? Seeing none, I would direct the committee's attention to uh, testimony from the Association of Property and Casualty Insurance Companies from Marley Carpenter and the American Property Casualty Insur Insurance Association, Hillary Segura. And um, uh, if, if Representative Miller could tell me how to say Hillary correctly, that would be great. But uh, thank you. Um, if there are no other opponents, is there anyone wishing to appear neutral? And anyone else at all on 2242? Thank you. My earlier comment was a correction from a previous committee, which uh, to a committee meeting, which a few of us will, will recall, where uh, Representative Miller provided a good laugh at my expense, which was appropriate. Um, if there are no further uh, uh, conferees, we will close the hearing on House Bill 2242. Thanks to everyone who brought that forward to us. And committee, that takes us to our, our next step, which I think you're trying to be clear to me. Um, we can go to Senate bill, but uh, I think I'd do our overview finally, if you stand ready for that. Um, so one of the things that we had talked about as it related to the mandates that we had discussed is just making sure we had a good handle on the process and that we were all thinking the process was the same process. And uh, the vice chair had done some work to lay that out, and I had asked him to share that. And I'd just ask him to walk us through that as it relates to mandates, and then we will come back to Senate Bill 29. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, I'm, I'm sharing the screen right now, so it should be up, up, up top or on your screen if you have a computer. Uh, these are not the slides that went out, so it's my fault. I'll make sure I send these out to you so you have the examples. So just as a reminder, where, where, what's on the screen? Well, in a second, we'll be on the screen. We'll be where we finished off, laying out the ideal process. There we go. All right, so up in here, where we had the upper left-hand corner, you had the mandate concept. Again, that's presented to us. We have two speed bumps that are built into here, which the next block across the top is the CBA or the, um, the cost-benefit analysis. 
So going next to that, then you have the proponent will take some kind of action. And in this case, for us, what's written in is we have two actions to take. One is a bill, or the other one is a proviso. Either one works the same way as far as getting it into the system. From that cost-benefit analysis, then a, and the uh, state employee health plan then conducts analysis as well, and they come up with a fiscal note. And that's what's then applied to, this bi to the bill. And typically, the bill will take you just through the test track and the reporting. So as you see that, if it passes, then the test track is done. It's typically done for no less than a year by, by statute. And then it has a, a finding that has to come out, and that'll be about March timeframe. And then after that, once you decide what you have, then you can, if it's a good finding, then you can decide to proceed, but it takes another bill to get there. If it's a bad finding, then we just don't do anything and it all goes away. But it takes another bill to get us to move in, and then once it passes, then the mandate gets uh, implemented or not, whichever way we go. All right, so that's the ideal. That's what the plan is. That's what they designed, two speed bumps to slow the process so we get good data as we go through it. What I did do at the direction of the chair, I went back several years with research and looked at past mandates to see kind of what some of the requests had been. Not ones that passed, just some things that have been turned in so we can kind of see what we might face. All right, so. Let me interject briefly, please, sir. and thank you for working through that. Just to be clear, and I think many of you understand it better than I do, but some of us are new to the process. The cost benefit analysis in the second block was referred to as a couple of things. It was both a fiscal and a social impact statement, I think, in statute, and uh, described what we would do to help prepare for the action. And then the test track is implemented by running through the state employee health plan. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. So just a little more color on what a couple of those steps were. So sorry to interject. No, absolutely. I appreciate that. And if others have questions, please ask as we go along. One of the things about the CBA is it the, the proponent can ask um, the research department here in this building, and they will provide data for that. The chair can also request it in a letter if it's needed to put more emphasis on it. But again, it's just emphasis downstairs. It's not really needed, but it is something we can do, especially if the chair or the committee has an, another burning question or say, you, I want to address this specifically, then that can be done as part of it. Okay. So one, here's one of the examples that I found going through it. So a bill was submitted and um, they did a cost benefit analysis. They then put in the bill submission, went through the process, requested a, a test track to be done. However, in this example, what they did was um, oh man, sorry. Um, what they did was they asked for it to go ahead and be implemented. So what you see coming down the left hand side after the test track, the findings are there. However, if the findings weren't good, you uh, or if they were good, the mandate was already built into the bill. So there's no step to come back. But if the findings were bad, then we actually had to submit a bill to undo the mandate before it got implemented, I mean, as it was being implemented, or in this case, taking away a mandate that was already approved. So uh, that was one of the ones I found out there. It's kind of, it was an interesting thing, but you had to read into the bill to realize what they had done in that request. So it's just something that would speed up the process because it skips a step. And if all things are good, then off you go. Um, again, that's what a lot of these things we're doing were to try to speed up the process. There no, yes, sir. So I'm curious on that one. This one was was before us. Did did it actually pass? So did that bill pass? And uh, in the creative, uh, or well, may not be the right, in the different writing of the bill, then did that jump straight to implementation? It did not pass. Okay, it got hung up. Thank you. Too far. Sorry about this. to make sure we get these things right. All right, the next one here is uh, no CBA was done. A bill was submitted to go into a test track. So all the systems were followed except the very first speed bump. They put the bill in to just go through the test track, stop at the findings, and then another bill would have had to, been, had to be submitted. Uh, this is another one that did not actually get passed. Uh, and, and again, trying to speed up the process, did not ask for the CBA, didn't realize that they could do it. And that's what held them up. Any questions on this one? So I haven't seen a lot of them, but it seems 
is is this somewhat regular that we might see one submitted without that and say, well, we'll start and jump to the test track to get better details? Is, is that a common approach? Not a lot, because if you want your bill to pass, you really need to have the best data and the best numbers, because if you're asking an insurance company to make a mandate, uh, you know, it's about the dollar. It's about the dollar for the policyholder and what that covers and what it allows. It, like the one in the amino acid bill that we did several years ago, um, it came back that it cost three cents, I think, for those on their rider in addition. So that was a very, very low cost item. But anytime you're looking for a mandate, you want to be able to make sure that if it's an expensive mandate, there is enough uh, population out there to spread that cost. And um, I think you also have to look because when we looked at the amino acid bill, and I'll give you just a quick note on that. What it is, is kids born with the inability to process protein. And so these kids would have to go to the hospital on a daily basis to get IV uh, medication. Um, the interesting thing was there was a new milk product out on, on the market, um, a baby formula, that they could take at home. Insurance wouldn't pay for them to take it at home. It was cheaper, but they wanted those parents to bring that child in daily for an infusion. Well, what kind of trauma does that do to a little child, a baby? What is the impact on transportation? You know, you have to look at the, the spectrum of everything. And so um, uh, they test tracked it. They test tracked it, and it was so minimal that the state's already gone ahead and put it on without us doing anything. Um, but you could have a lot of other incidences. We've had quite a few comments on hearing aids. Hearing aids are expensive. Um, and uh, there's been an attempt for several years to try to get a mandate for hearing aids. That may be something that comes up, and there's probably a bigger demand for hearing aids, I will tell you, than the amino acid bill. But um, you have to look at what the population is there to spread that cost, um, what it's going to do to overall policies, and um, when a bill goes to a test track like this and then it is not passed, the insurance companies are quite happy. Mr. Sneak could tell you that real quick. And it's not that they don't care, and but it's, it's the expense of it overall. And I've had my discussions with the insurance company and, and um, the process of making money. But our, our, what we have to do is look at what's best for the people. Does it involve a lot? Does it involve a few? And what is the population? Thanks, Thanks for that additional uh, experience that you have in working through them. So other questions? Uh, please continue. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. So in this example here, it's a they did a CBA, they did the bill. However, they asked to skip the test track because they had the data they thought from the the CBA, and asked to go straight into implementation. Uh, again, this is another one that did not pass uh, simply because they they just did not want to skip the test track uh, process. Okay, and then I, I just have two more quick ones. And in this one, there is no CBA that was done. No CBA was done on this one. The bill was submitted, um, and they requested to do the test track, but they also wanted to go straight to implementation. Um, and again, it's I, the way I took this thing and what I read from some of the testimony, it was that this, they just needed to speed it up. They thought it would be important enough, and they could get enough of their data uh, just from the test track. But again, remember, in that test track phase, it... it it's a, it's a minimum of a year, but then there's also another break of a year potentially or two in that process. So it's really important to read the bill, the bills that come through to make sure we understand what the test track impact is as well. And then the last one that we have on here is, huh, this one was a, an interesting one where they, 
skipped it all. They decided to not do the CBA, not do the other thing, go straight to implementation. The way I understood this, this was kind of viewed as an expansion of a mandate that already existed and wanted to expand the scope a little bit more. So that might be something we would see in going through this process and then where do we fit in here because it doesn't really give us any differentiation for an expansion of a mandate. We have to decide how we want to take care of those things. But if you follow even an expansion through the process, it would still need to go through those various things. So, and then the last thing up there on the chart is again, just to remind us what, what ideal is for us and what we wanted to do. Again, CBA, bill submission, approved test track, Based off findings, then we go forward from there with a new bill and implement. Conscious, slow, methodical to spend the mo money appropriately. Okay, with that, Mr. Chair, hopefully it wasn't too long. So thanks, and thanks for ending with the clean slide again, just to remind us of the process. That was helpful for me. So any questions or further comments? Thanks for thinking through that, and that might give us a framework to apply as we consider some of those mandate bills that have been brought, and uh, please catch me on that uh, with any thoughts that you have on those that are before us and uh, how we might best proceed. So with that, we will step into our hearing on Senate Bill 29, I believe, and I'd begin with an overview from the reviser. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senate Bill 29 is the Senate version of House Bill 2072, which amounts PSA 40-2CO1. Uh, the Senate Committee of the Whole unanimously voted to pass this bill, and it was referred to the committee upon its introduction to the House. The bill amends the effective date of the risk-based capital instructions that insurers use to file their annual risk-based capital report. As you recall, the date changes every year to the last day of the immediately preceding year. And that amendment occurs on page two in line two of the bill, where, as you can see, the date changes from 2019 to 2020. Uh, the Senate Committee on Financial Institutions and Insurance did amend the bill by making it effective upon publication in the Kansas Register, and I can stand for questions. Thank you. Committee questions? So the, the, the committee, uh, the Senate committee did make a change to make it uh, effective upon publication in the register? That's correct. I, I believe they were very anxious to uh, make this, they, they were anxious to show how enthusiastic they were in their support of this bill. Very good. Thank you. And uh, Representative Neighbor. As a history on this bill, we have heard this already and changed that date, have we not? And this was their matching bill. And what they did, in essence, was take it from statute book to Candace Register with no other changes. In fact, this was on the consent calendar. Thank you. So correct. The House bill has passed out, and the Senate had passed their version also. So. Uh, I forget our House bill number, if anybody has that reference. 2072. But... 2072. So 2072 is out, and it's over at the Senate. So this is their version that's now to us and uh, would be our opportunity. Essentially, I think we clearly agree on the 2020 and the extremely controversial nature of that part of the bill. Um, so then it would be whether we would want to change it back to being uh, upon publication in the statute book or appear to or approve it this way when we come to work it. Representative Neighbor. Is it uh, possible to ask Lee, who is with us from the insurance department, what may what differences makes for you? Uh, thank you, Representative Neighbor. Uh, I haven't had a chance to say this uh, very often uh, yet this year. A difference to us doesn't matter. From a process standpoint, is something for you all to consider, but publication is irrelevant. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Other questions?
His name Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think I heard enough of that conversation that this motion might be in order, but I would move we suspend the rules. We act on this measure today. I am more than happy to consider the committee's request at that. Uh, we, we do have time, but it's we've got a handle on what we want to do potentially, and I think that we could go there. So if there is a motion to suspend and work the bill today. This would be a vote on whether to work it today, then we would take up the matter should that pass. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Riley. Is there any discussion? Not. Representative, you may close. Oh, wait. Representative Neighbor, sorry, I didn't catch my peripheral vision. I am so tiny, you just can't see me. That's not true. Um, one of the things we have as an option, too, is to, uh, when there is a committee appointed to resolve some of the insurance issues, this may give us some leverage in a different way if there were a committee to meet uh, at the end of session when bills are presented that aren't quite the same. So, you know, I I personally could go either way, but I think sometimes after doing this for a couple of years, it's nice to have a couple of things that we can hold back and we can sometimes argue on that art, on that, uh, that base. And since it has no effect on the insurance department, um, that's that. That would be the reason for I, not I think, doing. I think I have my instructions with the consent of the second. I would like to withdraw my motion. Either either way. So, thank you. If uh, any any further questions or discussion on the hearing portion, I don't believe we have anyone planning to appear as a proponent. Don't believe we have anyone appearing as an opponent, neutral, or anyone else at all on Senate Bill 29. Should be able to remember that much. If there are no other conferees and if there are no further questions, we will close the hearing. And uh, that brings us to the end of our activities for today. And again, uh, if we wish to wait, we're just fine. We can, we can go either way on. With that, anything else for the good of the committee? Seeing none, uh, we will take up Senate Bill 29 on Monday. I'm trying to remember if we have other things. We'll, we'll be uh, needing to look at 2242 on either Monday or Wednesday. So uh, we will at least try and maybe tidy up if there's any difference between a couple of numbers that we had. And uh, then um, we'll, we'll see what other issues we may be able to address. I do want to thank Representative Miller for a couple of things, and one is to bring my attention to bonding in general. The bonding rate is actually very attractive at the moment, so that has stimulated another set of thought for me, a bigger issue than I had planned on addressing this year. But if indeed our bonding rate is only 2.7%, uh, yeah, uh, and, and I had as well, um, it, it may behoove us to uh, at least look into that issue, and I appreciate that coming up. Uh, so watch for that to show up as a new one. It's coming pretty fast, but uh, not, not to some of you that were thinking about it before me. Other than that, uh, we're adjourned.